So um, for some of our listeners who might not know, um, you're a very successful A&R at Atlantic Records right now. Mm -hmm. And um, you signed many important artists throughout your career. So at what point in your life you decided to work um, closely with artists and become an A&R? I decided to work uh, in the field of A&R, which I didn't know existed. I didn't know what A&R was until I read an article uh, on Puff Daddy. This might have been in 1994 or five, and A&R is basically a talent scout. Someone gets paid to go out and look for talent and to pick records, you know, off the album. And uh, I, I threw it into, I threw it out into the universe, which sounds like the generic thing to say, but quite honestly, in hindsight, that's exactly what I did. And you know, you start from there. Um, and I started working my way into the business or looking for a way to work into the, into the business in a variety of ways, uh, interning at a production company, answering phones. Uh, I kind of tried photography for a second. I, I bought a disposable and would go to events and just like, you know, hey, can I get a quick photo? Not with me, of course, just of the artist. And, um, you know, that was a fun way to get access into these, uh, into these events. And then eventually I landed, you know, a, a gig at the Source magazine, which at the time was the Bible of, of hip hop and the biggest selling music magazine on the stands uh, by the time I was done in my tenure there. So, yeah, that's that's how I got into a &R. And you witnessed the evolution of hip hop, as I would say, and you've seen all the change throughout the years. What's your uh, take on where the hip hop is headed and what's its impact is going to be in the future? It's still young. That's the thing people don't realize. Like I caught, I was fortunate enough to document the second tale of hip hop, its golden years. Like prior to that, you know, you had, you know, the old school, then you had the golden era, which was like the era that I came up on. And then I was a first-hand witness to the era that came after that, which is up for debate as to what to label it, the throwback era, the golden era. But um, that was when hip-hop really became massive commerce, at least for the first go-around. Um, you know, um, Biggie, Tupac, like a whole another level of legends came out of, the, came out of that time period, which is the 90s, of course. And... Um, sometimes we got to remind ourselves it's still young hip hop is I don't even think it's 40 years old yet maybe it is but even still that's relatively young for any kind of music genre um, it's evolving it depends on who you ask it's evolving for the good it's evolving for the bad um, but every generation is different I think I got to remind folks because I have a much more broader reference um, when Run DMC came out they were frowned upon by the generation before that and, you know, when the Puff Daddy era came into play, that was frowned upon by the purists and the MCs. Just like, you know, the kids now the, the, with the tattoos on their face, the SoundCloud, they're frowned upon by the generation prior. And at some point, these kids are going to frown upon whoever the next generation is going to be. And we don't know what that is. And that's the beauty about this hip hop thing. It's evolving. I love where we're at now. You know, um, it's an acquired taste. But you, um, if you could find the right people and the right artists, and, you know, I think you can have some fun with it. And for me, I listen to music nonstop, so my ears numb, so the really good stuff stands out. It almost like rings my ear. Uh, for those of y'all who still haven't, I rely on my ear more than I do on metrics. And um, you know, I'm right now keeping my eye out on who's the kid inspired by Tyler, the creator. Who's the kid inspired by Travis Scott, who put out some of the best body, his best body of work to date? Uh, there's a kid that's going to be influenced by these guys. It's going to evolve from what's going on now, you know. So um, it's 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 a good time. And as an ANR, you have an artist roster of your own. So how do you recruit talent? What are some of the like key components you look for in a talent? Uh, it's a good question. Uh, I always find something, I try to find something distinct, uh, whether it's a voice, perspective, approach, just something distinct that's going to separate it apart from everyone. Um, I've kind of got a bit of a reputation for playing on the left side of the field. Um, I came up just looking at things a little differently. I like to look where no one else is looking. I try to hear what nobody else is hearing. And sometimes you land upon, you know, you know, a, a major, you know, a major moment. Even when I was at the source uh, at the time, my main job, one of my first jobs was to curate the unsigned hype column. 
the unsigned hype column at that point was the most prominent outlet that an unsigned artist can get. Prior to me taking over the column, um, the column had discovered DMX, Mob Deep, Capone Noriega, Common, DMX, it's like legend after legend. So that was a big responsibility, but that was also for me, my portfolio to show that I can find talent. So during my run there, I would highlight, you know, David Banner, Cardinal Official, Joel Santana, but the most prominent was Eminem. And I remember when I first profiled Eminem, this must have been in 97, white rappers weren't like active like that. It wasn't like a thing. Like you had the Beastie Boys, people were still, unfortunately, white rappers were still stigmatized by like the Vanilla Ice thing. Um, so, you know, here comes this white rap artist who just is just so fucking good technically you know and is holding his own amongst his peers and i remember when i handed it in and you went to press back when when print magazines was something um you you go to press and my the main founder the editor not the editor i'm sorry the main publisher david mays came up to me and was like what is this like that's eminem yeah is he good it's like he's really good um, I know it's a little different because you barely get to see a white rapper prominently featured in that particular column or in any part of the magazine in general. But um, as you can see, that panned out quite well. About two years later, he ended up signing with Dr. Dre and the rest is history. So um, I developed the habit of just looking where no one else is looking, believing on things that you know not everybody believes in. I think you got to hear and still feel an artist. Um, so when I approach artists and what I'm looking for, it's those little qualities. I got a couple of check boxes that go in, in sync with my gut, you know, and my and feeling. I still believe that counts for something in this day and age. I think it's really cool that you're looking for stuff that's out of the norm and not really common. That's the only way we're going to grow. That's the only way this whole thing grows. You that's know? true. So. And uh, how did throughout the years uh, your career had an impact on your growth as a person. What are some of the things that you discovered about yourself or like evolved in a way? Wow, that's an awesome question because I don't think people, and I've had this conversation recently with folks, I don't think you realize with the pressures of having to deliver as an A&R, it starts with you. Um, I've always said, you know, somebody told me this one time and I never forgot it. The A&R is the last one thanked, the first one fired. You know, like you are, you're, you're, you're you're, you, you, you're only as hot as the last thing that you had, you know, like, and um, that you signed or were involved in. And um, that can take a mental toll in a business that can very much be very judgmental. If you're driven like I am and like most folks in our business, you have a standard uh, that you want to accomplish, you know, and you say if you don't reach that standard, you start questioning yourself and just like feeling like you're a failure and, you know, again, this is a very judgmental business that we're in. Um, so I've learned a lot being self-aware. I've During my later years, I've taken a much more zen approach um, to this business because, you know, this business, like any business, is filled with characters. And if you allow these characters to really get into your system or into your psyche or in any way, it throws you off your game. Um, so, you know, I came up working around, you know, some of the most insecure people, petty people, good people, um, ruthless people, um, inconsiderate people. And you realize that it's human nature for everyone to think for themselves. That's just how it is. Some people are not, are not like that. But um, in, in navigating these, these quote unquote treacherous waters, you gotta have a approach that will still keep you sane. So I've learned a lot about myself in doing that, you know, like, you know, my, 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 my spidey senses tingle at certain characters because the business is littered with the same kind of character. Oh, he's not a music guy. He's more of a such and such guy. Oh, this guy's definitely a music guy. But you could tell he or such and such, you know. So, um, yeah, and it's still a process. I'm still growing, you know, um, as a human being, as an executive. Uh, I'm, I'm still continuing to grow. And a lot of that is through my personal lessons, but also watching other people and what not to do. It's the one thing I don't think people do in general. Like, forget about, you know, what they're doing. Check out what they're not doing. So hopefully that answers a bit of that question. It definitely does. Yeah.